All right. Good morning, everyone. Looks like we're our room is filling up quickly. Wow. Nice turnout again. So um, anyway, thank you for being here to our regular monthly legislative action of the Greater High Desert Chamber of Commerce. Um, we continue to have great turnout on these meetings. We have 51 people RSVP. So got to tell you folks, we never had that many people in person. So thank you for attending and, and hopefully you're finding some good information here. Um, I think our meeting will be fairly quick today. So we'll give you some time back in your day, but we're going to go ahead and get started and we're going to move right into our legislative updates. So Shannon Dunkel, if you can unmute, um, she is with Congressman Jay Obernolte's office. All right, good morning, everybody. So good to virtually see you all. Um, I do wanna make an introduction, a quick introduction. We have Lily, she's brand new in our office, uh, but I wanted everybody to get familiar with her. Uh, you may see her out and about in the community. She's gonna cover mainly the Morongo Basin, Highland and Ukaipa area, uh, but we may bring her up here um, to, hold, uh, to cover some events that are up here. So I wanted to introduce her so you guys can be familiar with her. Pleasure to meet you all. Looking forward to seeing you guys out there in the community. Yeah, and happy to be here. Yeah, so um, for Congressman Obernolte, the last few weeks he has been in district um, and hosting community coffees uh, throughout every city. So from um, up in Mammoth, down here, um, in the, here, here in the high desert, um, from Morongo Basin, um, speaking with constituents and updating them on what's happening in D.C. Um, and it's been great. We've had good turnouts and we're really excited to get the congressman out and speaking to everybody. Uh, we hosted our Veterans Resource Fair on Monday, which was great. We got to speak to our veterans. Uh, we did have uh, the ranking member of the Veteran Affairs Committee, Mike Boss, uh, come out and attend the Veterans Resource Fair along with a round table with veterans so we can help um, in any way that we can on the federal level. Um, and a lot of the of what Congressman Overnolte speaks about in uh, his legislative updates are about the budget. Uh, we are in a $28 trillion um, deficit. Um, and as you guys all know, you know, inflation increases, you know, our economic growth is going to slow down. Um, and it's just going to be really hard to pay back if we continue in this trajectory. And um, so the congressman is going to work hard to address that issue. Um, and hopefully we get it under control. And that's all I have. But if anybody has any questions, please let me know. All right. I know that um, the congressman has been all over the place. I mean, wow. He has been we've everywhere. Been busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I've had I was sending people to his meetings, and then I saw him at the 9/11 thing um, at the college, and then again that night at another event. So I know he is all over his area. He says when and he's in district, he wants to be busy. So we take that to heart. Yeah, it, it looks like it. How many miles are on his car at this point, right? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, yeah, um, if you ever get a chance, go on, just Google the national debt calculator and just see how fast those numbers are spinning as far as our deficit is. It will scare you for our children and grandchildren um, as we go into the future. So anyway, well, thank you. Um, was there any questions for Shannon? I haven't seen any in the chat. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, we'll move on to, has Rebecca joined us in the room yet? Yes. There you are. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I was a little bit late. I've been waiting for the new bills to come through, and they have came through. So if you'll bear with me, I'll try to go through a few of them. Um, what I did want to share was that... Uh, what our office has been uh, dealing the most with in these last few weeks was numerous, numerous calls from constituents uh, opposing AB 455 and AB 1102. And um, AB 455 was going to um, mandate that Californians show proof of vaccinations. Um, that bill was shelved until January and also AB 1102, and that would establish legal protections for employers who mandate the vaccine for their workers or require them to be regularly tested for the COVID-19. That was also shelved uh, till January. Um, so not that they're not coming back. Um, they are, I, I think they just didn't want them to uh, pass right before the recall. Um, so those are temporarily 
on hold, but they will be back. And our office did take uh, over a thousand calls from from many of you, from locals. Um, actually, all calls were from constituents. And usually, when there's a big issue, the calls that come in are from all over California. And this was the first time that every call was uh, from a constituent. So we're going to uh, keep an eye on that, and I'll keep you posted. Um, all the bills for this year have been heard and neither passed or did not. Now the governor has uh, 30 days to sign into law those bills or veto them. And so a few of the bills that, um, I think I have a couple business ones that would be related to our uh, small business folks. And these are bills that passed. Uh, AB 150 revenue and taxation creates new tax credit programs that could provide long-term support for businesses slow to recover from the recent economic downturn, while also incentivizing the hiring of homeless individuals, establishes a new elective tax. It would reduce total federal and state taxes for S-Corps in California, providing some much needed financial relief to cover uh, to overtaxed Californians living in one of the least uh, tax friendly places. Senate Republicans did support this, uh, but attempted to amend the bill to reestablish the net operating loss deduction that was suspended indefinitely in 2020 when the legislature was expecting multi billion dollar deficits as opposed to the surplus uh, that did materialize. Also, for the business community, SB 151 regarding economic development, provides for several new grant programs that could support numerous struggling businesses uh, regarding live venues and performing art centers across the state, um, which we all know some that have been left out of previous fiscal relief efforts. So this bill also provides additional time for nonprofit cultural institutions to apply and receive grant funding approved that was approved earlier this year. Uh, the Senate Republicans were generally in support of the bill, um, and Senator Wilk uh, did support that bill. Um, there was a couple of bad bills that passed. Um, again, we took a lot of calls in opposition to this bill, and uh, mainly from law enforcement and other uh, constituents in our area. And SB 357. Uh, would prevent police from being able to arrest anyone for loitering with the intent to engage in prostitution. Many of these arrests result in the uncovering of sex, sex trafficking rings. So this bill would remove one tool that law enforcement has to fight against the sex trafficking issue. This bill passed, uh, but Strangely, the author used a procedural motion so that the bill would not be before the governor for several months. So he's he doesn't he did so that he wouldn't have to sign it right now. Um, but that will be before him shortly. Um, also, let's see. Um, let's move on to a couple of good bills. <laughs> it's early in the morning. Um, there have been uh, there were several bills uh, to address the EDD crisis, and um, let me see anything regarding small businesses. Where's EDU? There's one of education. Uh, SB 144 film and tax credit that provides 90 million in additional tax credits for relocating and recurring television productions for two years creates 150 million uh, studio construction tax credits which will provide fiscal relief to businesses struggling to recover from the economic shutdown. Uh, most Senate, uh, most Republicans supported this bill, including Senator Wilk, uh, whose district if you remember his district covers all of um, the Santa Clarita Valley, Antelope Valley and the Victor Valley. 
and uh, there's a lot of uh, filming going on in those, in the, especially in the Santa Clarita area. And um, Senator Wilkes um, supported this because it provides um, for the industry, for that business industry. Let's see. SB 152 elections makes changes to the current recall process. As everyone knows, we just went through a big ordeal and this makes changes to the current recall process to allow a recall election to be called sooner by authorizing the legislature to waive the joint legislative budget committee's cost review time period of 30 days under certain conditions. The bill also authorizes 35 million for the secretary uh, Secretary of State to recall activities of which uh, when more than 17 million carries the potential for partisan abuse. Uh, the Senate Republicans did oppose this bill. Um, there is one in education. Uh, we talked about this uh, throughout the year and that was AB 130 uh, and that um, will direct billions of dollars for education relating um, relating to um, multiple education uh, categories. And um, that was also supported by the Senate Republicans. Um, any more on a few cannabis bills passed that we had been talking about. Um, however, they still, um, they still did not cover the problems that we're having in our district with the illegal grows. So the Senator was not, was not happy with those and he, he um, opposed those. Um, they did not do anything to help the, the strain that we have on our, com our communities with the illegal grows. Um, what did they do? They, um, established the Department of Cannabis Control and transfers the cannabis licensing and regulatory functions uh, to other departments, to the California Department of Food and Agriculture and the California Department of Public Health. So um, let's see. There's several more bills that have passed through the legislature, but again, they, they won't be um, signed or vetoed until October 10th. The governor has 30 days. So um, I will update you next month on uh, more bills that have been either signed or vetoed. That's it. All right. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Looks like we do have a couple of questions here. We have one, SB 357 is being held by Se Senator Weiner. How do we pressure Newsom not to sign it? Um, business suffer if streets cannot be cleared of prostitution rings. Can Wilk get human rights or religious organizations involved? No one cares about complaints from law enforcement. Um, there's a bunch of questions in there, Rebecca. Yeah. So. Um, well, we definitely care about the complaints from law enforcement. They're the boots on the ground. They're dealing with it. And um, the only thing I can think of, uh, for for us to help is um remember how earlier i was saying um we get a lot of calls um and when when it's all the const our district constituents calling um usually the senator is already on the same page with them um i believe the people need to be calling the um, author's office, which in that case is probably Senator Weiner, um, call the author's office and um, bombard them um, as we are who are already on board and the other um, committee members, the other um, opposing parties. But um, it's a shame that tools have to be taken away from already a struggling battle. Right, I'll relay, I'll relay that on to Senator Wilk. All right, and if you could just throw your contact information in there, um, you know, um, Shannon and Rebecca and everybody, if they have more questions and wanna discuss that further, where to direct them, they can reach directly out to you. Um, there was a couple of more questions. 
was there a bill number for TV station tax credits? Is, is there a bill number for that one? And then there's also, what is the bill that's regarding the cannabis? Um, I think they're wanting numbers there. Okay. Let's see. So the film tax credit is SB 144. And that was the one that provides 90 million in additional tax credits uh, for the film industry. And um, AB 141 and SB 160 is cannabis. And there, there were more uh, cannabis ones. I don't see them here. Uh, the main two for cannabis, AB 141 and, AB, and SB 160. Okay. And then there was another one that says, what's the pro argument for SB 357? Let's find out. And then there may be any of you um, field representatives, I see there's a question in here, what's the website where we can read about these bills? If you could just grab that link and put it in the chat for everybody. Um, it is thrilling reading. I have to let each of you know that it keeps you on the edge of your seat to sit there and read each and every one of these a, you know, SBs and ABs. So I highly recommend them if you cannot sleep at night to pull those up and start reading them. Uh -huh. All right, looks like Cassie put in there to answer the one question, the website. Okay, looks like Pat or just put in a few, um, a link to some different things that he was talking about also. All right, so while you're looking that up, Rebecca, we'll come back to you. Let's move okay. off to Cassie and let her go ahead and give her report and then we'll circle back around to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone. Um, again, I'm Cassie. I'm with the Office of Assemblyman Smith. Um, so I have a few um, updates that I'll be talking about that the Assemblyman's been working on. First off, it's the end of his session. Um, this was his first legislative session. He started back in January when he got into office and he just ended his session this month. So he's back in the district. Um, he's only been back for a little while, but he's already been doing a lot of community events. So I'm sure a lot of you guys will see him around very soon. The Assembly and the Senate has sent the governor around 800 bills. The governor has until October 10th to sign these bills into law, veto the bill, or allow the bill to become law without his signature. Assemblyman Smith has also worked with other members of the legislature to pass AB 359, which would make repro city um, for doctors easier between California and other states. He's also built some momentum in regards to unlawful cannabis activity. A bill he co-authored was AB 1138. This could oppose fines up to $30,000 per day for people aiding and abetting unlicensed cannabis businesses. This legislation was aimed at storefront business operations and landlords, but we have a lot more work ahead of us to keep moving forward against illegal marijuana. 
Um, this year, we've certainly seen some very anti-business and law enforcement bills come through. AB 48 prohibits the use of rubber bullets and pepper gas that are used by law enforcement officers during a protest or a demonstration, or a protest of demonstration. Um, AB 1223 imposes another 10% tax on handguns, rifles, and ammo, just another attempt of our government to make it harder to purchase a firearm. SB 357 repeals the crime of loitering with the intent to commit prostitution. And um, SB 339 creates a pilot program to consider taxing you for the miles driven to force zero emission vehicle purchases. Um, going more in the illegal cannabis um, topic, throughout the next few months, one of um, the Assemblyman's top priorities for this next year is to address the legal marijuana grows in our community. Over the next few months, um, over the past few months, he's met with hundreds of constituents who are concerned about this issue, including indoor grows that often go hidden in residential communities. Therefore, our legislative team will be drafting language in collaboration with our partners that we have identified over the past 10 months, including the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors, Sheriff, the community, and various water stakeholders. Um, He's also working to introduce legislation that addresses inefficiencies within Proposition 64, the theft of water and the environmental damages of these grows. And then the issues with mandatory vaccines. Um, the Assemblyman is very grateful that Republicans and moderate Democrats in Sacramento ultimately killed two proposals that would mandate the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and those proposals were AB 455 and AB 1102. Rebecca had touched on that a little earlier. Um, staying engaged and calling your legislator is very important. Um, Assemblyman Smith ultimately believes that is why those bills were killed in the committee process. So it's very important to stay up to date with everything and make sure you call your representatives. Um, and then Assemblyman Smith is opposed making the COVID-19 vaccine mandatory. Painting a broad brush for public policy is not a good idea. Um, we need to let the individuals, individuals consult their own doctor um, versus the government when it comes to these types of decisions. So that's all I have for you guys today. I did put my email in the chat. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to send it to me that way and I can get you guys the best answers. So have, hope you guys have a good day. Thanks for having me. All right, thank, thank you, Cassie. Cassie. Shannon, okay. I do have, yes, I do have that language. Okay. So SB 357, um, the, argument for it is that California's law, existing law, uh, criminalizes loitering with intent to commit prostitution, gives law enforcement a tool to harass and discriminate against uh, Blacks and trans communities, um, and particularly women of color. The Safe Streets for All Act is what they're calling it, um, will take away this outdated and subjective penal code. Um, so um, the officers um, do use it as a tool. Um, however, um, to the reason for removing it is because of um, discrimination. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. I don't see any other questions right now. Let's go ahead and move to Kimberly Messon, Supervisor Paul Cook's office. Good morning, everyone. So I just had um, just three things that I wanted to touch on briefly. Uh, as we all know, um, about the last board meeting that we had roughly uh, three weeks ago, it was brought to our attention that a probation facility was wanted to be purchased in the city of Victorville by the county. Uh, our office was actually notified on a Friday evening and that weekend we started working with our CAO's office and notifying them of the concerns from the community and that it was of a concern to our office as well. Um, the language written within the agenda um, was a bit vague and didn't actually specify what the services would be provided for. So we wanted to make sure we received verification on that. That Monday we actually uh, met with our CAO's office again and asked that they pull the item from the agenda um, from that Tuesday board meeting. And then um, after further the discussion, it was decided that it was gonna be pulled as a whole and the county was not gonna pursue purchasing the property uh, for a probation facility. 
So we just wanna um, really just thank our community members, the school districts, um, and everyone who was concerned that reached out to the office and notified us. Uh, these are things that um, you know, we wanna make sure that we're responding to, and we wanna let you know that we're here for you, uh, whether if it's a Friday evening or a Saturday or Sunday um, morning. If you know um, someone in the office that you can get a hold of to let, let us know, we will start working on it immediately. So the supervisor wanted to make sure that this is something that was not um, pursued because of all the concerns that we did receive and the close proximity to our school districts as well. So as mentioned, as always, please feel free to reach out to myself or any other staff member in our district or San Bernardino office, um, and we will get answers to you as soon as we're able to. Um, and then this is also when community input really does make an impact. So please feel free to reach out. Um, we are also starting to host more um, events in district. Currently uh, on Tuesday, September 21st from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., our office is gonna be collaborating with the Public Defender's Office, Workforce Development, um, as well as Abundant Living Family Church to host an employment and resource event. Uh, we're really excited about this. It's the first time it's held in the high desert and we're hoping to make it an annual event. We are also starting up our youth advisory council that's for high school students as well, just to get them more involved in um, civics and then have them be able to engage with different departments um, so that we're making accessible as well. Uh, we're really excited to be able to bring back events to the district uh, now that COVID um, is hopefully uh, staying down and we have less restrictions and able to meet. Um, and we're looking forward to bringing more events to the district as well. So um, please, we do look forward to announcing those as soon as they're planned and established, um, but those will be coming in the future. And that's the update that I have for today. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, I am not seeing anything at this moment, Kimberly, but thank you very much. And um, if everybody didn't notice I, uh, on this group, um, one of the great things that uh, Greater High Desert Chamber has been able to do, um, you know, um, Kimberly mentioned the uh, probation center. And um, what was nice is the survey, um, we were able to send one out, very simple. And um, that information was able to go back to Mark. And then we were able to reach out and say, this is what our membership, you know, is also looking at. So just like um, it was mentioned on this call, you know, please make calls to your elected representatives or to, you know, the people or the different representatives that have the bills that you do not like or that are very bad. Please do that. Um, do not underestimate the power of that because we've seen um, some great things that the chamber's been able to do that Mark's going to talk about here in a moment um, as he gets into our report. But, um, you know, make your voice heard. You know, sometimes we have a lot of apathy. Um, I worked two days this week with the election and everything, and that was an eye-opening experience. It, it ran very smoothly, but it was still very eye-opening of how many people just do or don't come out. So um, be involved, make your voice heard. And if we can help you at the chamber, always reach out you know, to Mark or myself or Marshall or, or any, of the, any of the board members. All right, Mark, it is all your turn. All right, just a few things. Uh, I, I wanted to quickly mention through the California Chamber Bill positions, um, Greater High Desert Chamber obviously opposed AB uh, 1041. Uh, this would have significantly expanded the family leave uh, and paid sick leave. Uh, and this, we got a notification with some good news that this has been moved to the inactive file. Um, what this would have done, it would have ex significantly expanded multiple existing leave requirements in California that apply to employers or five or more, including small employers with limited employees who are struggling as a result of the pandemic. So we were pretty excited that that uh, moved to the inactive file. A few things recently from the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance, uh, we opposed SB 262, this bill requires Bail to be set at zero dollars for all offenses except for serious or violent felonies, violations or of specific protective orders, domestic violence, sex offenders, and driving under the influence. Uh, we oppose that. We also oppose SB 727, uh, which is a labor-related liabilities direct contractor. Basically, this bill extends as of January 1st, 2022, a direct contractor's liability for a subcontractor's wage violations to include penalties and liquidated damages arising from a wage violation uh, unless the direct contractor takes specific steps to monitor payroll and correct violations. Um, so we oppose both of those bills. 
Uh, and then I just got from our representative at the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance. Um, he and I will send this out to our members in our next legislative action blast. Um, of the 33 bills on which the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance took a position to support or oppose, um, 13 made it to the floor in the second house, but only 11 made it to the governor. Um, the two bills that failed to pass are ones that the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance had opposed. Uh, they were um, uh, AB uh, 1395, which would have mandated uh, California Air Resource Board to establish new climate goals to achieve 90% admission reductions by 2045. And then already the mentioned SB 262, which would have required bail to be set at zero for all offenses except serious or violent um, offenses. But anyway, um, I have a list of 13 bills that were referenced uh, that, that our Inland Empire Chamber Alliance have taken a position on. I will email all of those with links if you want to take a look uh, next week in a legislative action uh, blast email. And that's all I have, Shannon, unless you want to add anything to that. No, just take a look at those. Um, we have been very, very fortunate with our alliance with the Inland Empire Chamber Alliance. And um, wow, you know, there's just uh, good to hear 17 to 19 other chambers um, band together um, to work on these things. Because again, you know, I was kind of joking around about the legislation earlier. It's hard stuff. I, I, it's, it's hard. It's tricky. It's, um, you know, and it makes it nice when you have that many partners to work with. So um, thank you, Mark, for that report. All right, we're going to move on. We have a, um, another report. I had asked Don Brown. He and I think Stacy Duvall was on here earlier. I don't see her right now, but Don's going to um, unmute, and he has been sitting. Him and Stacy both have been sitting on the Homeless Solutions Task Force over in Victorville for what are we talking about, Don? About three years. Yeah, and, right three years, yeah. And they have. Um, I recently, I think they've started to make some um, um, good, possibly good strides. We did um, talking about partnerships and the strength of the, you know, the Greater High Desert Chamber now has over 650 businesses, you know, that as we have merged, that gives it a certain amount of, um, you know, uh, wouldn't want to say power, but influence. I think that's a good one. And Don being part of the legislative um, group over at the um, High Desert Association of Realtors asked Mark, myself, and Stacy to um, sit in on one of their meetings. And in, in my, in the last 15, 20 years in my, uh, my history with the chamber, we, we've never uh, gotten together to collaborate on how something's working uh, or never been, you know, we just have not collaborated. And they have about 12 to 1400 members. So the ability of people to um, work together in this high desert just makes us all stronger as a region. So I'll let um, Don give us a, an update. And again, if Stacy's on here, I, I don't see her. I think she may have had to drop off. Um, both of them have sat on that for um, three years and they are definitely our experts on what's going on. Okay, well, thank you, Shannon. And yes, we were very excited about our meeting on the 1st of September. Um, we're looking forward to collaborating on other issues as they come before us as a community. Uh, Paul Marsh is on the call today also. He sits in on the uh, uh, Homeless Solutions Task Force also. So uh, Paul, if you have anything you wanna add, uh, by all means, I don't have the bully pulpit here. I'm, I'm more than willing to uh, go ahead and let you chime in at any time. Um, kind of exciting. Uh, we had a meeting on the 14th. Uh, the last month's meeting had been canceled for a multitude of reasons. But we got a good update from Cassandra Searcy and some of the department heads. Um, City of Victorville, as you know, has been focused on uh, doing a wellness center down there by Eva Del Park in Old Town, Victorville. Uh, the city has uh, had a grant once upon a time about uh, a year ago, and they couldn't quite put everything together that the uh, grant needed from the home key source to uh, make it happen. So they've gone back after this home key funding again this year. Uh, it's on a first come first serve basis. They're going to be submitting their application by the 30th of this month. Um, they are better prepared this time in as much as they do have plans in the works and all uh, engineering reports and environmental reports completed. So they are really in good position to uh, access this funding. State has uh, about $1.4 billion that they're going to allocate for homeless uh, housing. Uh, in different variations. Um, out of that, uh, Southern California is going to get about 102 million of that. 
Uh, we're going to be applying, as far as the city of Victorville is concerned, for, for about one sixth of that money to build that facility down at Evadel Park. Um, part of the funding will go for operations, which will go on for approximately two years. Uh, the city is, is uh, doing something a little different. Um, they're not going to be stick building this whole project primarily because of the uh, additional costs that would be incurred if they have to go and pay prevailing wage for all the tradesmen that will be on the project. So the, the, the tradesmen will be doing all the ground preparation, the slabs, the underground plumbing, et cetera, but they're bringing in modular units from a company out of San Bernardino that will be designed and built in factory, which they do not have to pay prevailing wage on. Uh, prevailing wage is uh, mandated on any project that the city is getting any grants for or providing any land for any development on. So it gets to be a little bit sticky when you're trying to build an affordable project, but you're having to pay anywhere from 30 to 40% higher wages for the tradesmen that are working on it because you have to pay prevailing wage, which is basically union wages. Our, our tradesmen make very good salaries up here, our non-union tradesmen. So it's almost like an artificial increase in the cost of the construction of a project. So the city's doing a, a good job in, in getting their costs under control. Um, they're looking at about 45 days uh, for, they'll be waiting on about 45 days after the 30th for the announcement of the award. Um, there'll be about another 45 days um, for the award of the actual physical contracts. And then the city said it'll take them about 15 minutes, 15 months, 15 minutes, 15 months from award to occupancy. So this is not going to be like the Desert Haven project that has been going on out there off Stoddard Wells Road since March of 2017. This will be a very rapid construction schedule, very aggressive construction schedule. Real quick, uh, the interim shelter um, it has been housing a lot of uh, our homeless. Uh, you guys probably in driving around have noticed that the streets are getting cleaned up by code enforcement and they are getting relocated into the interim shelter, which is out at West Winds. I have gone out there personally and inspected it. They have a couple of military tents out front that they're using for intake. Uh, the residents do have uh, portable showers, restrooms, um, and they're currently bringing in an animal clinic for the homeless that do have uh, pets that uh, they have not been able to place uh, prior to losing their home and becoming homeless. Uh, another quick tidbit, the state is upping the limit that's allowed for the construction of individual units. Uh, the former amount that everything was capped at was 100000 uh, they are now raising that limit to 150,000. So that, that seems a lot like a lot for those of us in the private sector, because for $150,000, we could probably build you two plus units. But that's again, getting back into the prevailing wage uh, issue. Code enforcement has been very aggressive in uh, clearing out illegal campers that are camping on private property. Um, they are issuing administrative citations they are offering services out at West Winds and at other facilities that are located in the city of Victorville that will house the homeless. Uh, in the last 30 days, they were able to house 59 additional homeless uh, and in different uh, facilities. Um, a lot of you have noticed that out behind the new Amazon Fulfillment Center over on Balsam, that area has just recently been cleaned out. And you'll be happy to know that they're using work release inmates to clean up those fields after they move the homeless out. I personally think you ought to take the homeless and say, here's your, here's your gloves, here's your bag, go clean up your own mess. But, you know, I'm probably old school in my approach towards that. Um, last but not least, um, as they transition into the wellness center from the interim shelter, uh, it appears that the interim shelter might be in existence longer than originally anticipated. I, I want everybody to remember, though, no matter how efficient everybody is and how much resolve a community may have in trying to uh, work on the homeless issue that they may have, you still have to get the cooperation of the individual that's in whatever situation they're in. Some people simply are okay with living in a 
a pop-up tent or going from shelter to shelter and have no desire to actually uh, get into any kind of normal, what we would consider normal housing and try to go back into the workforce as a productive member of society. They have become conditioned to their current environment and their lifestyle and for some it's okay. So we're gonna work real hard co collaboratively and collectively on this issue. The city is, is helping us. So there's really nothing that we really need to do. We're just attending the meetings and making sure we keep the pressure on that they understand that we want our streets cleaned up and we want these people housed in a safe and humane manner. Uh, any questions, I've got the chat up. So you guys, I'm, I'll be glad to answer those, but that's all I have for today, Shannon. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Of course. Looks like we do have a couple of questions, Don. It says, um, one of them says, I've seen an increase off of Elevato and Roy Rogers across from the Home Depot by Scandia in the field. And then there's another one. Is there a loitering law for downtown? Okay. Uh, first question is, the uh, code enforcement folks are focusing on that area off Elevato and Roy Rogers that they only have so many people in code enforcement to go around. A homeless issue or a loitering issue for the sheriff's department is a category five call, which is about the lowest priority there is. They have one through five, and, and so it's, it's pretty low on the totem pole. So we have to rely on code enforcement to enforce the uh, uh, issues of uh, trespassing, which is really what we're talking about on private property. Uh, a couple of years ago, we worked with the captain then, uh, Sam Lucia of uh, Victorville, and uh, created a no trespassing uh, agreement between the private sector and uh, uh, the city of Victorville. Uh, the chamber does have copies of that, those documents. And basically, you enter into an agreement where you're allowing city or, or uh, city code enforcement or the sheriff's department to enter your property and uh, remove uh, the homeless from the, those uh, facilities. Um, we have uh, seen that work very effectively, but every time you got to remember, every time you clean up one area, the homeless don't go away unless they go into a shelter, and that's a limited number. They simply move to another location. So if we clean up one area, they'll gravitate towards another area. Usually you're going to see them up and down the freeway and in areas where there are gas stations and uh, fast food restaurants, because that's where they go to usually panhandle to try to get some of their uh, income that they have for whatever purpose that they're going to do. Um, now, the other issue, um, let me scroll up here on the chat room real quick. Uh, so I make sure I answer all of these for you guys. Um, the loitering law in downtown, um, again, that's the no trespass ordinance that they have in place, but the, the state has a right to camp law in effect. And what that enables the homeless to do is if they're on public property, they have the right to camp. Uh, if there is not adequate facilities available in the municipality where they're camping. Now, the way we're getting around that is we now with the interim shelter and the uh, high desert homeless shelter, the rescue mission and other private uh, providers of, of housing, uh, we now have enough beds by state law to house the people that are camping or, or loitering in the city of Victorville. So this all started about July 1st of this year. So they're working on trying to get these things cleaned up. But again, they can clean out one area and gosh, guys, I, you know, we manage a lot of property in the city and we will see them get cleared out of one area and then move back in in another area. Usually not on, on properties that we manage because we have a full-time security force that's always patrolling all of our properties now, which we had to do just to try to uh, allow our, our, basically our businesses to what's called enjoy, have quiet enjoyment of the use of their space so that they don't feel threatened by the homeless that want to come in and get a cup of water, use the restroom and then lock themselves in the bathroom or, or come in and try to solicit the people that are trying to enjoy their lunch or whatever for money. So um, I, I, we understand everything that I see here on the chat, uh, on the chats. Um, uh, businesses are afraid to open downtown 7th Street. You're absolutely right. Um, there, are, there is an issue down there. That's where the homeless have been concentrated. Um, there are some housing projects that are in the works that I'm doing some consulting on right now where they're trying to get these people off the street. But again, we're not going to have 100% success. 
So you know, we can tell you all these wonderful things, but I don't want any uh, expectations of, gee, we're going to have just, you know, Mayberry RFD here pretty quick and nobody's going to be living on the streets. Just not going to happen. There'll still be some, some out there that uh, either have figured out how to live that type of lifestyle successfully or that are hard cases that uh, are having issues with drug and alcohol addiction and, and of course, mental illness. Okay, any other questions? Um, looks like there's one last one from David Wiley. Um, I'm, I think everything that you just said was it answers even his question too. I continue to see people passed out on the sidewalks in front of the gas stations at 7th and 18th and Park and Palmdale. So I, I think you answered that. Um, they, they can't be can't be everywhere, but it yeah, sounds like and, they are uh, working on it. And yes, there is collaboration with the County of San Bernardino on this. Um, and we are working with, of course, the Sheriff's Department and uh, as part of the Homeless Solutions Task Force, um, we have about every service provider and county agency sitting on that, on that group or on that board. And so they're all working on trying to address it. And, and one of the things we do not see when, when Paul or, or uh, Stacy and I are on there, we don't see the, the service providers um, or the agencies that provide services to these people from the county or the city or whatever it may be, uh, trying to uh, advocate that we let these people camp on the streets. They are looking to try to house them just like we are. We're looking at it from a business perspective that we want our community to look attractive and be appealing to people that may either want to move here or that may want to locate a business here. Um, the providers are looking at the same issues, but we're also looking at people that uh, tend to live on the street full time are a lot more likely to suffer some kind of violent crime or have issues with not being able to get off drug or alcohol addiction or not be treated for the mental illness condition that they may be suffering from. All right. Okay. Thank you, Don. Is there any more questions for Don? Okay. All right. The, um, you know, the collaboration, you know, I, is um, between the different groups up here is, it just makes us stronger. And, you know, I appreciate those that are on this call and there's a lot of really good questions today. Um, one of the things I want to point out to our assemblymen will be speaking at the Victor Valley Republican Club tonight at six o'clock at the Holiday Inn. So if you want to go out and hear what Assemblyman Smith um, it's a look back at his first 10 months in, um, as a freshman in office. So that should be good. We've heard Jay and some of his stories. And, um, you, you know, for these guys in the beginning, their, their, their learning curve is vertical. You know, I was talking with Jay the other day. I said, is this tough? And he's like, it is tough. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, you're like a genius. So it, <laughs> what's it for like everybody else? So anyway, um, another thing I always want to Mark and I kind of end up with the day to day um, legislative. I'm your legislative chair issues. And then but we do have a committee that works very hard, too. It's nice that we kind of have our tentacles in all different areas of expertise. Um, we recently um, wrote a letter um, on Provident um, Kaiser. Obviously, Provident Kaiser will be a very good thing for our high desert. However, the second half of our letter was the concern, obviously, about St. Mary's. And so the, the, we sent off a letter that I believe was very um, good for both entities and showed the support of the area. Um, I'm going to um, then we, and there's different members of our committee that have gone off and said all these things. Casey, do you, can you thumbs up or thumbs down? Is there, I know you're sitting on there because you've got the medical background. Is there anything you can tell us or is it still kind of a surprise? Um, it is, uh, we had our first um, ad hoc committee meeting last week. Um, really just some introductions and getting some ideas out there. Um, they are committed to repurposing um, the Apple Valley facility. So we're looking at options um, and perhaps some different um, ideas on um, high acuity care. What is the difference between a hospital and um, a high acuity, it's like an urgent care, but on steroids. So um, we're looking at those things and um, how to educate the community that um, a lot of the services can be done outside of a hospital um, versus inside a, a hospital that we are all used to. Um, 
but we I will keep everybody updated and um, we had a really, really awesome meeting and we're looking forward to a meeting here in the next couple of weeks. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And then you know, I want to recognize, you know, we've got um, a couple of our, I, Lisa Lamb sits on our uh, legislative affairs. And so obviously she's everything education and, and Jan Gonzalez also, she's a board member, but um, we have those experts in those areas. And then Pat Orr continues to help us out in all things Apple Valley. So um, it's, you know, Mark and I cannot do this by ourselves. You know, like I said, we get some of the day-to-day -day stuff but we certainly have our partners on the legislative um, committee that helps us and brings things to our attention. So wanted to give them a shout out. So right quick, um, I want to see, is there any other questions? I do not see anything else in the chat. Does anybody have anything else? All right, if not, we're gonna give you about 10 minutes back in your day. Thank you for joining us. Our next legislative meeting will be on October the 21st and we will see you then. Thank you.